Oh yes, oh yes, it is Masker Radio, and I am your host, Members Only Dave, guiding you through the shark-infested waters on the airwaves today, as the content is rather shark-centric for our eighth installment. Later on, I'll be speaking with Steven Scarlatta. He recently finished a shark documentary for Shudder that you are not going to want to miss, but right now, check this out, a first for Masker Radio, as I'm speaking to film professor Kate Levitt. She also knows a thing or two about sharks. And she also does some stuff with Masker Video she'll tell us about. It's going to be a great time. We're going to check it out right now. It's Masker Radio. Come on! Yeah! VHS is hot dog. VHS is hot dog. VHS What's the matter with this guy? Is he even speaking English? What's going on VHS here? This sounds like VHS trouble to me. VHS is hot dog. Hey, kid, you're VHS all right. Here, that's funny. Go get some speech therapy. VHS is hot dog. VHS is hot dog. Neither a blackout nor a city curfew will stop young couple Juan and Mercedes from celebrating their new home. But when Mercedes discovers a stranger who claims to be the real Juan, an epic violent confrontation takes place, after which the new, more vigorous Juan replaces the old, fulfilling a dark, perverse plan. Massacre Video proudly presents controversial Mexican actor Santiago Sendejas' 16mm post-apocalyptic masterpiece, Plan Sectional, uncut and on Blu-ray for the first time. This is Massacre Radio. My first guest is none other than Kate Levitt. She's a film professor at Stony Brook University, and she also works with Masker Video as a representative. So I just mentioned it, you're a representative for Masker Video, but in your own words, what exactly would you say you do with Masker Video, and what does being a representative entail? Yeah, I feel like that, um, I'm kind of just maybe... <laughs> I don't actually know what I do. I kind of just like am psyched about it. And then sometimes I write the copy for the DVDs. Kate, what has been the most exciting thing you've worked on or been a part of in your time with Masker Video? Uh, the most exciting thing I've done is recently did an interview with Santiago for the release of Plan Sex Now that's in the book that comes with the DVD. So we, we did like a, a whole interview about the film that came out really well, I think. Kate, okay, we're talking about sharks today, and I know you are a fan of sharks, so I gotta ask you, naturally, what is the worst shark movie you have ever seen? Mm, I don't really watch movies about sharks so much as I research sharks and watch YouTube videos about sharks. There's some bad YouTube videos about sharks, but mostly they're just people talking about which shark they think... Like, the, cool, the coolest YouTube videos about sharks, before I talk about the bad YouTube videos about sharks, are... Um, people talking about like sharks of the deep ocean versus sharks of the shallow waters, for example, and sharks of the deep ocean are my favorite shark. But sometimes you'll get a YouTube video that's just someone talking about like their favorite shark. And I don't care about somebody else's favorite shark. I want to know about sharks generally speaking. Shark Week just wrapped up not too long ago and people seem to have a fascination with sharks. So I ask you, Kate, what's the most terrifying thing about sharks in your estimation? The most terrifying shark is a frilled shark. And it's a deep sea, sh deep sea shark. And what's scary about it um, is not only that it has, like, I think something like 20 layers of teeth, but also that it uh, it's a prehistoric fossil. So deep sea sharks, like the frilled shark, have been around since prehistoric times and haven't changed that much. They're some of the earliest sharks. And just when you see them, they're scary looking. They have a lot of teeth. They're really big. They haven't evolved. So they look like aliens. Like, you've never seen sharks like these deep sea sharks and they're terrifying and along those same lines kate what are some of the things that you find even more terrifying than sharks probably diseases <laughs> i think the only thing ter more terrifying than sharks in this world are diseases and those are pretty much the only two things i'm afraid of very cool now this story came across my desk earlier today headline sharknado releasing in theaters for the first time fully remastered with new special effects to celebrate the film's 10th anniversary now i know you don't really watch many shark films but i think there's something to be said about the popularity of Sharknado, especially if it's being released in theaters. Is this something that moves the needle for you at all, Kate? Uh, good question. I have not seen Sharknado. I don't really like watching movies that denigrate sharks, and I feel like that sort of shark exploitation 
is um, against my sensibilities about how I think sharks should be depicted in cinema. Sharks flying from the sky, I don't think that's an appropriate way to treat sharks in cinema. Everyone always talks about the same kinds of sharks, but there's all kinds of sharks. There's bioluminescent sharks. They're really cool kinds of sharks. And all we know about is just like the shark from Jaws kind of sharks. You know what I mean? I want shark diversity and I want positive portrayals of sharks in cinema. And that's what I'm about. If you had to say, what is the worst thing about modern Hollywood studio movies, Kate? Yeah, I guess I'd say um, probably like the homogeny of themes and the lack of risk taking are my two least favorite things. Do you have any examples, uh, anything within the past year that you've seen that would register? That's a good question. I honestly like haven't been watching much mainstream cinema recently um, because I had just like haven't had time. I haven't seen Barbie yet, for example. So I would need to think about, that's a hard question for me to answer on the spot. I need to think about it. Kate Levitt is my guest. She is a representative for Massacre Video, as well as a film professor at Stony Brook University. And I wanted to ask you about that. What would you say is the most rewarding thing about being a film professor? I like to watch students change their mind about what they think cinema can be. So I think they, a lot of students come to school with preconceived notions about things they can say with film or ways that they can use film and come out of school with a greater depth of both stylistic and narrative possibilities that they can employ in their work. And as a teacher, how exactly do you go about doing that? Can you discuss any of the tactics that you employ to attain such a result? Yeah, good question. I think the, the main way to do that is just by watching a wide variety of films. We watch pretty much the gamut of everything in my courses. We watch, doc, we watch documentaries. Pink Flamingos was a big one that blew a lot of people's minds. No one, they had, many students hadn't seen a film like that before, and I think it changed their perspective. We watched Cannibal Holocaust. I think that also changed a lot of people's perspectives on what a film could be. So it's just fun showing them films that they've never seen before and might not see it in Kate Levitt has been my guest. She's a film professor at Stony Brook University, a representative of Massacre Video. Kate, if the good fans of Massacre Radio would like to contact you on social media, how can they go about doing so? They should not find me on social media. Kate, thank you so much for your time. Hi, I'm Nathan Stabler, and I've been a real estate investor for over 13 years, and I want to buy your house, especially if someone's been murdered there. You ever, like, lift up the carpet and see impressions from where, like, a dead body had been laying there, dead and bloated for weeks on end? That's the kind of house I want. You ever take a blacklight to the walls and find so much blood splatter that you thought maybe the room was home to a former slaughterhouse? That's the kind of house I want. Just sell it to me. And remember, the murder the better. My name is Nathan, and I have cash. In the beginning, there was VHS and Beta, then DVD, and now, in the 21st century, thanks to the advent of modern technology, we have streaming. With thousands of titles all at your fingertips, sometimes it's hard to find something even halfway decent to watch, but it doesn't have to be. Introducing SubGenius.tv, the only streaming service you need with hundreds of hand-picked titles at your convenience. Titles like The Pink Ladies, Corruption, and Night Terror. You'll never run out of interesting cinema to consume at home ever again. SubGenius.tv has it all, and then some. Besides, who has the space to store physical media anyway? Streaming is the future, and SubGenius.tv is here to pave the way. Don't be a coward. Sign up today with plans starting at $5.83 per month. SubGenius.tv. Don't make us tell you again. Massacre Radio. Yep, you guessed it. My next guest is director Steven Scarlatta. You know him from his exploitation doc on Shudder. And he also made the Yodorowsky Dune documentary as well. Steven, thanks for joining Massacre Radio today. How are things in your end of the waters? Yeah, man, all good. Can't complain. Let's get started. So, Steven, I know your most recent piece is the aforementioned shark exploitation doc on Shudder. What is it about sharks and their history in film that really got you to want to do this project? It's a very boring answer, but it was Jaws. And, you know, like a lot of people 
the movie that got a lot of people interested in sharks. And that, that was what it was for me. It cursed me to become a filmmaker, that movie. And it got me obsessed with sharks. Um, it was like I was chasing that dragon. Of, I needed to, I just kept needing to see shark movies to see if it would ever come close to Jaws. But of course, none would, you know. What are your thoughts on Jaws 2, by the way? I like Jaws 2 a lot. I think it's a very solid sequel. And I think it's a good movie. I think it's a good shark movie. I have no problem with all the Jaws movies, to be honest. Now, I know it's hard to imagine, but as it relates to the film, where do you think the shark genre would be today if it weren't for the movie Jaws? I mean, Shark Week just ended not too long ago, and sharks are a big business. What are your thoughts? I, I don't know. I got you know, there were shark movies before Jaws. That's in my documentary we touch on, but they're not shark movies. They just kind of feature sharks. The sharks will be on the poster, but they'd barely, barely be in the movie. Um, I don't know. Maybe something else would eventually come out featuring them and people. But I, that's a really tough question to answer just because the movie was made so damn good. And it was all an accident, you know, because everyone knows this, but the shark wasn't working. So they had extra time on that island to keep making the movie stronger and tighten and tightener. You know, it's like uh, Spielberg was chilling out with his writer with, you know, the whole time. And they just kept making it stronger and stronger. So it's just that perfect accident. Well, you know, if it wasn't going to be Jaws, it was going to be something else, sharks or otherwise, you know, there's always got to be a first and it just happened to be Jaws. I don't know. Would it have been another sea creature movie? What What would it have been? Like, who, who knows? That's a, that's a very good question. I, I do not know. What are some of your favorite shark movies from the past 30 years, and which other horror or comedy franchise do you think would benefit most from a shark crossover? Ah, that's a, that's a very good question. A uh, shark crossover. Uh, let me see. My, I mean, my definite favorites are in the last... I mean, I'd say The Last Shark from 81, 82. It, you know, Great Whites is the other title. I think that's definitely one of my favorites because it's, it's beautiful. They're really trying to do Jaws, and it just feels authentic. There's a movie called Red Water with Lou Diamond Phillips and Coolio from 2003 that was a made-for-TV movie. I think it's solid. I think even if you watch it today, you'll really enjoy it. I like Nightmare Shark also from 2018. A bunch of people in a house and they're all having the same shark in their dreams. And it's Nightmare on Elm Street with a shark. Crossover, though, that's a hard, that's a tough one because I think they already crossed over sharks with everything. The sharks, they crossed them over with storms, mm -hmm. you know, with Evil movies, and now the big thing is um, putting drugs and, and animals together is the new thing right now. A meth gator movie, a raccoon or a crack movie coming out. I never would have thought that would be the next thing. Moving on from sharks and on to documentaries, Stephen, what are some documentaries or films in general that you'd say changed your life? No, the documentary that changed my life that got me interested in documentaries is uh, Decline of Western Civilization Part 2, The Metal Years. That one... I saw that ad in the paper when I was a kid, and I just saw all those bands, and it was rated R. And I was like, oh, my God, Faster Pussycat, this movie's rated R. What's happening in this movie? You know, I, could, I was dying. You know, I needed to know. And that's the movie that got me into documentaries. And then after that was like Endless Summer I enjoyed when I was growing up as a documentary. But the other one that if you watch my documentary, you'll, you'll probably see some influence is a documentary from from the early 2000s called American Nightmare, directed by Adam Simon, and that's about the 70s horror movies like um, Last House on the Left and Dawn of the Dead and Night Living Dead. And the filmmakers themselves are talking about how like real life events influenced those movies. So it's probably Decline Western Civilization 2 and The American Nightmare. Those are the, like two documentaries that had a huge impact on me. I wanted to ask you about your Alejandro Jodorowsky documentary. What was the biggest revelation or the biggest piece of knowledge you gained about the man himself in your time working on the project? Hmm. That's a, that's a, that's a good question. I've been so stuck in the shark world <laughs> lately. Uh, I haven't thought about that in a while. But, you know, I, I think what it was, I think it was when the movie came out. Because I was just a huge fan of his. Like, huge, huge fan before we went off and made the movie. And I think what it was was after the movie... When the movie came out, it was just like how much like people were inspired by him and how much people were inspired by how it didn't work out, but he just moved on and it was so positive about it. I think that's what it was, is positivity. Because, you know, I wrote so many scripts I couldn't sell, you know, I option scripts and nothing ever happened and it was very heartbreaking. But I think it was like just the way he's able to move on, you know, to just to move forward. 
So I got to ask, are documentaries something that you look to continue doing, or do you maybe someday want to direct a full-length feature film? And what would that look like? I'm sure you have a couple of ideas floating around, no? Yeah, I mean, I think what happened was, you know, you write so many scripts, and it's like playing the lottery. Are you going to sell it? Are you going to get it made? You know, and I was very lucky to have gotten like two scripts made. And then, you know, I'm doing the show Best Movies Never Made, this podcast. I mean, every week we're going, every other week we're going through movies that were never made. So I don't know if it's discouraging me a little bit, but um, I mean, I'm always going to try to write because I have so many ideas. But I think what happens with documentaries is what I enjoy is that you can start shooting it and it's like you got to finish it, you know, unlike a script where you spend all this time writing a script and then it can never get made. So I think that's why I've been kind of turning towards documentaries because I want to make stuff versus you know, spending time trying to create something that might not get made. Now, in doing research for this interview, I was looking at some of your credits, and I saw Viva La Bam listed. What can you tell us about your time in working on Viva La Bam? I know that was a huge show for a generation. I watched it all the time. Wildly popular. Do you have any fun or crazy stories you can share from your time working on that project? I wish. It looked cool on my uh, on my IMDb page. Like, what the hell were you doing? Were you running around with those guys? No, I was stuck in an in a editorial building the whole time working on that movie, on that show. I was working, like, uh, I had the night shift of, like, 7 p.m. to, like, 7 in the morning. And there was I, my only memory was there was a nightclub right outside the window of where I was because I was digitizing all the footage. I was watching all the hours and hours and hours of the footage that they kept shooting, you know, to try to make turn into something. And I just remember there was always this club across the street of people going there, having a good time, then people hanging out after having a good time, then they'd leave and they'd still be in this horrible office <laughs> digitizing these guys. <laughs> I wish it was a cooler story. I was perusing your Instagram, and I noticed that you go to the movies and see new releases fairly often. What were some of the bigger budget titles that you've seen that really surprised you this past year? I mean, definitely my, one of my favorites was uh, John Wick, because I'm a huge fan of Donnie Yen, and I'm a huge fan of Scott Atkins. So that was like one of the one that like really blew me away this year so far. I go see movies, and, and shockingly, I'll like watch something, and the next thing you know it, I'm kind of forgetting I even saw something. I want to know, Stephen, what is your favorite movie directed by a female? There are a lot of great ones to choose from. I like Mary Lambert. I liked her Pet Cemetery movies, especially. I, I, I saw Pet Cemetery 2 when I first moved out to L.A. at the Man's Chinese Theater. Man, that movie's pretty... I wasn't expecting it to be so crazy. I'm trying to think. Other female... I, I liked um, that one. The woman who made Eon Flux, she made that movie The Invitation, which I which I really enjoyed also. I dug that one. I do like uh, Slumber Party Massacre a lot. Really freaking awesome. Uh, Near Dark, of course, is great. Catherine Strip Bigelow, to, yep. Yeah, Strip to Kill, I really liked also when I was a kid growing up. I don't know how that holds up now, so I should, maybe I shouldn't be bringing that one up. So Paul Rubens passed away last week, and I got to ask you, Stephen, did you even watch Pee Wee's Playhouse back in the day? Do you have any fond memories of the man himself? Yeah, Pee, Pee Wee's uh, Playhouse, even though I was kind of older at the time, it was still trippy, you know, in a way as a kid to watch it. That was a cool show. Uh, Paul Rubens, I always like, I always remember him in his like little cameo appearance. And when he's not playing Pee Wee, I just kind of know him in his like little cameos, like in the Cheech and Chong movie, which I always get confused, the one where he played the, he's in a couple of them, right? Some, you know, unfortunately, the, the, the Cheech and Chong movie, they meld into one movie in my brain. It's the weirdest thing. You know, it's crazy. I was looking at their filmography pretty recently, and I think they made like, what, six films? For some reason, it feels like it's less than that. I don't know why. Yeah, dude, it's like next movie and Night's Dreams. They're like one movie in my head. And he's in one of those. But I do like him in, uh, I always think of uh, Meatballs Part 2, which is like one of the weirdest fucking <laughs> movies. But yeah, besides that, I always think he's like kind of, can't, besides like Mystery Man, he's always like kind of a cameo in most movies. Steven Scarlatta is my guest. Steven, we'll get you out of here on this. I know you just finished Sharksploitation, but what's the next project or projects you're working on? At the moment, I am outlining a couple of projects to possibly direct. The one I am working on right now is uh, I'm producing it, and Jim Coons, uh, my cinematographer on the Shark documentary, he's directing it, and it's about the world of movie novelization. And then I do a podcast, like I mentioned earlier, called Best Movies Never Made, and we, we talk about 
uh, my co-host and uh, producer from uh, the Shark Doc, uh, Josh Miller, who wrote uh, Violent Night. We go through movies that were never made. We try to interview writers and directors about their experiences trying to get certain movies off the ground. So that would, those would be my two current projects at the time. If people would like to connect with you on social media, Stephen, how can they find you? Man, I don't know. Is, is Twitter really dying? Like, I don't know. I am still on there. I haven't been invited to that blue sky thing where everyone's <laughs> going to. But you can find me by my full name on Twitter, at Stephen Scarlatta. Also on Instagram, at Stephen Scarlatta on Instagram. And on Twitter, you can if you follow me on Twitter. I have in my profile a link to the novelization documentary and we post the novelization a day and you can also find my podcast best movies never made through there also like i tried threads i don't think i like it and Mm -hmm. you know i don't know if i'm gonna be starting any of the other all the other stuff yet yeah actually steven uh it's funny you mentioned that because i think i'm in rarefied air the twitter icon on my smartphone still reads twitter and not x so i got that going for me which is nice it's weird what are you going to do? I just use it and then move on. Steven Scarlatta has been my guest. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining Massacre Radio. You have a nice rest of your day, sir. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. And that about does it for our show today. Special thanks to both of my guests, Steven Scarlatta and Kate Levitt, who I forgot to ask about the time she was on Judge Judy and sued a friend. Talk about dropping the ball. Hey, thanks for joining us. I hope there was enough shark content to go around for everyone to get a heaping of a plenty helping. I'm Members Only Dave, and I'll talk at you next week.